Good afternoon, and welcome to this briefing for state legislators being put on by the Department of Public Safety at the request of some legislators. I'm Tony Mangan, Public Information Officer for the Department of Public Safety, and I will serve as the moderator. We'd like to welcome everybody who's in the room, the public, and legislators and members of the media, both in the room here at the Capitol Lake Visitor Center and on Zoom. Here is how the meeting is going to work. We're going to start with the presentation by the two members of the Highway Patrol, Sergeant Kevin Kinney and Trooper John Burnt, who investigated the crash. They will go through the presentation that they have. Following the presentation, House members, both in the room and on Zoom, will have the opportunity to ask questions. Only House members will get that opportunity. So let us begin the presentation, and I will get, turn it over to the troopers. As Tony stated, um, I am Trooper John Burnt. Just a quick, quick uh, background on me. Uh, I've worked for the Highway Patrol for over 20 years. 15 of that has been as a state trooper. Uh, currently signed as the District 1 Crash Coordinator. Uh, I've investigated or been involved in well over 100 fatal crashes um, during my tenure as a state trooper. I am an instructor for the state. I teach the intermediate crash investigation, the advanced crash investigation, and vehicular homicide for the patrol officer. And good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sergeant Kevin Kinney. Uh, as you can see, I've also been on the Highway Patrol uh, just over 18 and a half years, uh, hired in August of 2003. Uh, my current position within the Highway Patrol is the Crash Programs Director or the Crash Reconstruction Program Director, and I oversee uh, the crash reconstruction for the entire state and also the Crash Assistance Program uh, as well for the entire state. Uh, I've also investigated uh, over 100 fatal crashes uh, and or reconstructed crashes myself. I recently in uh, May of 2019, uh, I graduated from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City uh, with my Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, and I also am an instructor, not just uh, in the state of South Dakota, but I also instruct for the Institute of Police Technology and Management and uh, other places as well. Some of the courses that I help teach all across the country would be intermediate crash investigation, uh, advanced crash investigation, crash reconstruction, uh, applied physics, uh, energy methods, and then uh, both of us also teach the vehicular homicide for the patrol officer, which is a course hosted by LAT here in Pier at uh, DCI. So we'll start with, we're trying to do as chronological uh, as possible with this. Obviously there may be a little bit of jumping in it, uh, but we're gonna try to keep it as chronological as possible. Starting with the events that occurred on September 12th, 2020, um, the actual day of the crash. On the day of the crash, uh, Attorney General Roundberg attended the Lincoln Day Dinner up in Redfield. Um, he traveled westbound on 212 from Redfield to South Dakota Highway 45 southbound on South Dakota Highway 45 to Miller, where he turned westbound on Highway 14 towards Highmore. <clears throat> At the Lincoln Day Dinner, we know that Attorney General Roundsburg had not consumed any alcoholic beverages. Uh, we know this from a couple of reasons, um, one of which was video that was obtained from, uh, it was Rooster's Bar and Grill in Redfield. Uh, interviews were done with people who attended the Lincoln Day Dinner Receipts were pulled um, from Rooster's Bar and Grill. All of this was done, and at no time was there any indication that Attorney General Roundsburg had consumed any alcoholic beverages on that night. Um, he departs Rooster's Bar and Grill, Redfield, at approximately 9.21 p.m. This is based on phone activity. Um, there's also videos and witnesses to that, but we base the majority of the times from phone activity. So it all relates to our investigation and you'll see kind of how that ties together as we go through. The first video or the first indication outside of the phone that we have of Attorney General Roundsburg um, traveling um, would be a, a video we located in Miller. Uh, there's a business called Farm Tech. In this video, you can see this is Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle as he's just traveling westbound on US 14 from Miller. 
And you can see that the time is 10.04 and 21 seconds. And I'd just like to, to add the picture that we have on the screen there. Uh, it appears that the car is kind of blurry and hard to make out. But if you're watching the actual video itself, you can actually see that it is a, a red Ford Taurus that's traveling by that location. So <clears throat> from the video, uh, we have 10.04 uh, p.m. And then at 10.14, using his state cell phone, we have he accesses a weather app. Um, at 10.17, he accesses the Secretary of State for voter registration totals. At 10.17.25, he accesses Yahoo Mail. At 10.20.28, the screen goes off, but then it comes back on instantaneously. At 10.20.49, he accesses Dakota Free Press. From, <clears throat> from Miller to just before Highmore, um, the GPS locations are there, but they're semi-sporadic. As he gets closer to Highmore, within a few minutes of the crash, the GPS locations become secondary. So every second we start seeing um, update locations on where the attorney general's vehicle and his phone are at. From that information from his phone, we can start determining speeds, times, locations, things of that nature. So now at 10, 20, 49 PM, he accesses Dakota Free Press. We'll talk about the speedometer that's later on in this, but for now, his speed is 72 miles per hour. His speedometer is actually indicating that he's 77 miles per hour. So as he's traveling 72, he thinks that he is traveling 77. At 10, 21, 13, he accesses real clear politics. Once again, his speed is 72 miles an hour. His speedometer once again, 77. He accesses an article at 10, 21, 45 PM um, called Riding the Dragon. His speed fluctuates slightly here. He's 68 to 72 miles per hour while his speedometer reads 73 to 77. At 10, 22, 48, the screen is off. The phone is locked as he entered the Hydeworth city limits. Um, with this, once again, we can, uh, the coordinates from the phone, we can determine exactly where he's at when these things happen. And he would be just on uh, the east side of Highmore at 10, 22, 48. Um, in Highmore, there is a gas station referred to as G3 or Hall Oil and Gas. That would be on the uh, southwest corner of the intersection of Highway 14 and Highway 47. There was a video that we located from that gas station. Um, from that video, we were able to determine a speed of his vehicle. That speed corroborates with what the cell phone speed says. Um, the speed limit through there is 45 miles per hour. Uh, the calculated speed off of the phone was 46 miles per hour. The calculated speed from the video is 44 to 48 miles per hour. Earlier that evening or earlier that day, um, Mr. Beaver was uh, in a crash of his own. Um, he had an event where his vehicle was located um, about three quarters of a mile west of where the actual crash occurred, the fatal crash occurred. Um, his vehicle was in the north ditch. Mr. Beaver was walking with a flashlight. That flashlight was found to be on. It was still on along the shoulder, uh, on the north shoulder. We'll show a map indicating where that was located at later. Um, witnesses stated that Mr. Beaver was walking on the shoulder near the ditch. Witnesses talked to Mr. Beaver and believed he may have been intoxicated. Uh, this video is of Mr. Beaver. This video was found at Mashik Grocery. Uh, Mr. Beaver is seen walking approximately a block down the sidewalk. Um, at no time was there any impairment observed in Mr. Beaver's walking. Um, he's maintained a steady pace, a straight line, didn't stumble, didn't fall. Um, this is the last known image that we have of Mr. Beaver prior to the fatal crash. The toxicology from the autopsy showed that the, there was higher, level, higher than normal levels of lorazepam um, in his system. When we searched Mr. Excuse me, when we searched Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle, BCI, excuse me, searched the vehicle. Um, Sergeant Kinney and I were present in the building, but we did not search the vehicle. Then BCI did locate these two 
parts of Mr. Bieber's glasses. Uh, BCI collected those, tested them, and did determine that they did belong to Mr. Bieber. During the autopsy of Mr. Bieber, the determination was made that he was traveling eastbound while he was walking at the time of the fatal crash. Just prior to the crash, Attorney General Roundberg accelerates to 68 miles per hour. The speed limit is 65 miles per hour where the crash occurred. This is determined based on the phone location information. At the time of impact, the speedometer would have indicated approximately 72 miles per hour. So the actual speed at impact is 68, but Attorney, Attorney General Roundberg believes he's traveling 72 miles per hour. Um, at the time of impact, Mr. Attorney General Roundsburg is traveling completely on the shoulder of the roadway. The shoulder in the area of the crash is 10 feet, eight inches wide. Attorney General Roundsburg strikes Mr. Beaver approximately one foot from the edge of the grass line. After impact, Attorney General Roundsburg stops approximately 614 feet after impact. If Attorney General Roundsburg stops, hits something and stops and does what would be referred to as a panic break, from 68 miles an hour, he would actually stop in 174 feet. And that was that is an exact number based on the testing that we did with Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. So it took him over three times the normal distance to stop. When Attorney General Roundsburg does stop, he is not completely out of the westbound driving lane. This is determined by the single photo that was taken on the night of the crash. This is a photo that was taken by Attorney General Roundsburg. The damage that you see to the vehicle in this photo is identical. This photo was taken within minutes of the crash um, and we'll be more specific as to those times soon. The vehicle is also located based on the tow truck driver. Uh, the tow truck driver, I interviewed the tow truck driver, James Lappy. Um, Mr. Lappy, I showed him a Google map picture similar to what you see here. Um, he identified the two approaches. Uh, Mr. Lappy explained to me that when he turned around on the approaches, he did not back up that far from where the vehicle would have been stopped based on uh, North Dakota's analysis. He would be about 110 feet away, which would be reasonable to what he would have explained to us. Uh, Mr. Lappy, the tow truck driver, never drove east of Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. He was always west of it, so he wouldn't have drove to the actual crash location. At 9 1, the 911 call lasted from 1024 22 to 1026 44. Attorney General Roundsburg states he hit something in the middle of the road. The dispatcher mentions the deer. At 1026 59, Attorney General Roundsburg's flashlight comes on. And when I say flashlight, I'm referring to his cell phone flashlight. <clears throat> At 10.33.15, the flashlight goes off. During that time, 848 steps are taken. Attorney General Roundsburg states he walked on the north shoulder with the light on. Mr. Beaver's body is approximately two feet from the shoulder. Mr. Beaver was mostly naked from the shoulders down due to the impact. He had a pale white complexion and a severed leg. Uh, when I stood at the scene, uh, Mr. Beaver was still there. Um, as I stood, I was literally two feet from him. The photo indicates in Attorney General Roundsburg's interview to North Dakota, how he held his flashlight, describing how he searched the ditch and the shoulder with his flashlight on for Mr. <clears throat> Beaver, who was approximately two feet from the pavement at that time. <clears throat> At 10.33.22, Attorney General Roundsburg takes a photo of his vehicle. Attorney General Roundsburg later states that Sheriff Bullock arrives approximately at this time. So in reference to the two, uh, the photo at 10.33.22, the flashlight went off at 10.33.15. So the flashlight goes off and the sheriff shows up and the photo was taken. The post-crash events at 1044-23 to 1051-38, Attorney General Roundsburg departs the scene and travels to the sheriff's house. 
At approximately 1047, we can see that the attorney general is at the sheriff's house. During that time, there's approximately 80 steps taken where he's um, being lent the sheriff's vehicle to travel back to pier. At 10.53 p.m., the Attorney General's phone is near the water tower. This is about the time that Sheriff Bullock stops Attorney General Roundsburg because he forgot the keys. Uh, Attorney General Roundsburg left the scene. The Sheriff realized that he didn't have the keys so that the tow truck driver could tow the vehicle. So the Sheriff ran him down, or excuse me, took, pursued him more or less, stops him, um, takes the keys from him and then returns back to the vehicle. The post-crash events will continue on with text messages. So after Attorney General Roundsburg gives the keys to the sheriff, he continues on the pier. During that time, he sends four messages. There's one audio message. Um, there's five received and read text chat messages. He places one phone call and he makes five others or excuse me, he makes one phone call that's answered, unanswered and five others that are. And that would be in the time from um, departing the scene after he gave the key to the sheriff to his arrival in Pier. The next day <clears throat> on September 13th, Attorney General Roundsburg returns to the crash scene. He's returning the sheriff's personal vehicle in his interviews with BCI, he states that he's going to check the south ditch for the deer. Uh, upon his arrival, he suddenly decides to check the north ditch first one more time, and that's when he discovers Mr. Beaver's body. He drives to the sheriff's house to make the notification thereafter. I was notified that morning. I traveled to the scene, uh, Sergeant Shane Snyder out of Huron was also notified and traveled to the scene. Um, Sergeant Snyder traveled to Pier and collected the blood samples from Attorney General Roundsburg at 1.39 p.m. Once again, we don't believe, there's no indication for us to believe that alcohol or drugs were a part of this crash on part of Mr. Roundsburg. DOT was westbound. Uh, DOT closed down the westbound lanes upon my arrival. Um, DOT was controlling traffic You'll see uh, a video and some other information that will show the westbound lane was completely closed down. Traffic was head to head. DOT was regulating traffic through the area. Mr. Beaver's, bo Beaver's body is approximately two feet from the edge of the pavement into the grass. Standing on the shoulder, it was easily noticeable while you were standing at the scene. These were the skid marks that were mentioned at several times during the investigation. The skid marks are not from Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. There's multiple factors that we determined they were not from his vehicle. The track width is different. Um, when I test drove Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle, the ABS functioned properly. And Lieutenant John Stahl was through the area um, responding to a crash previously and the marks were visible at that time on September 4th. We contacted the Hughes County Emergency Management. We requested them to bring their drone to the scene and fly over. Um, they responded for us. They flew their drone over the scene. They took photos and video um, of the crash scene prior to anything being touched. Um, this was as soon as I arrived, they arrived with me and we hadn't started a map. We hadn't done anything at that time other than close that westbound lane had been closed already. The forensic mapping, uh, we haven't discussed it, I apologize, that's coming. Um, the evidence documented and preserved for North Dakota, once BCI arrived, they started gathering the evidence. At no time did anybody from the Highway Patrol collect or attempt to collect any evidence. Uh, we located evidence and we began documenting evidence uh, upon the arrival of North Dakota. Um, I indicated to North Dakota what I had found, what I observed, and then North Dakota did an investigation completely separate from any findings that we had. Um, the flashlight, I did locate the flashlight. At no time did I touch the flashlight. Uh, when North Dakota arrived, I indicated the flashlight to them. North Dakota collected the flashlight, and when they collected it, 
They found it to be on, which I did observe. The fork along the edge of the road that's been discussed at different times, um, the fork was collected by North Dakota and it was analyzed by their lab, which we'll discuss here shortly. National Weather Service. I contacted the National Weather Service and requested any information regarding any weather events that would have been in the area to hinder visibility or contaminate anything um, after the crash prior to our arrival. National Weather Service, um, they had video from Miller and Highmore, or excuse me, we found the video we've already described from Miller and Highmore, but there were no visibility issues, no fog, no rain, um, anything of that nature. There was little to no wind at the time of the crash and the highest wind gust recorded from the time of the crash to the scene being secured was 17.88 miles an hour from the south southwest. <clears throat> we did a search on Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. We found that it was regularly serviced. It had been involved in prior crashes. Uh, the Attorney General admits to hitting deer in the past. The passenger side window windshield, excuse me, has a hole in it. That was the video, or excuse me, the photo that we just showed you here moments ago. That hole in the windshield relates to the glass that we found on the shoulder of the road, which we'll describe a little bit more here shortly. And the glasses were inside of the vehicle. So as we've already discussed, Mr. Beaver is walking eastbound on the shoulder, almost in the ditch, as he gets struck by Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle, Mr. Beaver's face goes through the windshield. His glasses are left inside the vehicle, half in the front seat, half in the back seat. The glass from the windshield goes over the top of the vehicle and sets down onto the shoulder of the road. And we'll show you how we measured that and how we documented that here. Um, the damage. Two attendant Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle is limited to 1.65 feet on the passenger side. This is a 3D rendering of Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. This shows where the damage is, and this shows the area that the damage begins on the passenger side. And you can see the 1.65 feet. Upon my arrival, after the drone had flown through the scene, I started to map the scene. Um, <coughs> This is the actual scene. You can see the cones as DOT had placed them. You can see the traffic as it was being stopped. Um, this photo would be taken facing the east. So this would be the direction that Mr. Beaver would have been walking as what you're seeing. Um, as traffic is stopped, it's diverted into the eastbound lane, allowed to pass westbound, so on, just as a normal construction zone would be. The total station that I used is set up along the grass. You can see that there. That is what we use to map the scene and forensically collect the evidence that we'll discuss shortly. Once I set it up, I started to use the total station to document everything with the data collector. I recorded the evidence. Trooper Nathan Moore was with me at this time. Trooper Moore, it's a two person job with our system. Um, I identified the evidence, I located the evidence. I instructed to Trooper Moore where to place the prison pole, and then I recorded that evidence. Once Sergeant Kinney arrived, Sergeant Kinney took over the total station, and I continued to locate evidence while Trooper Moore held the prison pole as I instructed him to do so. During this, we knew that there were small droplets of blood, which once again, we'll get to here momentarily. Um, but during that, they were difficult to see. And this was a part of when we did the quadrants to determine if there was any blood that we couldn't see. And it was also used to determine if the exact how far back was the first blood that we could see. So I was literally crawling around on my hands and knees looking for any evidence, whether it was paint chips, blood spatter, um, vehicle parts, anything at all that I could find. Uh, I was crawling around in the westbound lane as well as the shoulder. And while doing this, the only evidence that I found uh, was on the westbound shoulder or in the ditch. This is the fork that we've described. The fork is broken into several pieces. This is an old fork that was laying on the side of the road. 
The significance of this is, as you can see, blood spatter is hard to identify. The little arrows, you can see it on the rock. The reddish brown substance was determined to be blood. When you get it on the darker parts, it becomes more difficult to see. This is why I was crawling around on my hands and knees. As I crawl around, I can start to see things. The fork was very noticeable. We could see that the fork had a lot of reddish brown substance on it. Um, when you see a high concentration of something, that tells you something significant happened near that location. It wasn't sparse, it wasn't spread out. A vehicle was going 68 miles an hour when it hit a person and there was a concentrated amount of reddish brown substance left in that immediate area. And that's what we located and that's what we determined. The fork was collected by North Dakota BCI. <clears throat> that fork was analyzed and within North Dakota reports, you would see that it was determined to be human blood. And once again, <clears throat> there was no blood in the, the westbound driving lane. The only place, this fork, as you can see the grass um, kind of in the picture, this fork is right on what I would refer to as the edge of pavement where the, the shoulder separates into the grassy ditch. This is the location of the blood. <clears throat> we separated evidence into three categories. The first category I'll describe is the blood. The blood information that we located, um, the high velocity spatter you would see directly right in here. This vehicle placement based on our analysis is where we um, place Attorney General Roundsburg at the time of impact. So the vehicle in the diagram here is showing where he was at when this crash occurred. The high velocity spatter indicates the the little blue points indicates the majority of where the spatter is. So one of these little blue dots is gonna cover a couple of inches. There might've been several um, parts of blood spatter <laughs> under one of those blue dots. So there's a significant amount of blood right in this area. And then after this, we did not find any blood and I crawled on my hands and knees all the way through this area. And this was the only area that I found a significant amount of high velocity spatter. I'm not gonna say that there wouldn't have been one or two trickles through here that I couldn't see in the dark um, asphalt, but for what I could see, I could see it through here and there was nothing that I could discern to definitely be a reddish brown substance through here. And the same is true for North Dakota when they arrived, they attempted to look also. The fork, would be right here at this location, right on what I said was the grassy edge. And that shows also on here that it was right on the edge of pavement where that fork was at with the bloody, the reddish brown substance known as blood. Uh, the flashlight that I located was also right on the edge of pavement. Um, it was directly on the transition just as the fork was from the asphalt to the ditch. Before you go on, do you want to explain what each of the lines are just so that they know edge of pavement, rumble, strips? Sure, sorry. <clears throat> so the, the edge of pavement would be the top line right here. The blue line is going to be your rumble strip. The next line right here is going to be your, what we refer to as the fog line or the white line that separates the shoulder and the driving lane. So your fog line here would be your westbound driving lane. Here's your center lane. Here is your <clears throat> south side fog line, shoulder, and then south side ditch for the edge of pavement right here. Um, the vehicle, as you can see, based on the forensic map, crossed the fog line and the rumble strip with both sides of the vehicle to get to that location. <clears throat> Once we determined there was nothing in the area between the uh, high velocity spatter and the next area, the next area is where Mr. Beaver's body slid into the ditch. Mr. Beaver's body would have slid off of the car over into the ditch. As previously described, uh, Mr. Beaver's face came in the windshield. There are three types of pedestrian crashes that we can reconstruct speed. Um, there is a, 
uh, a vault over the top of the vehicle. There's a fender vault and there's a forward vault. Unfortunately, with this type of crash, when the body stays on top of the vehicle and rides on the vehicle, there's no speed calculation that can be done with that. And the other thing that it leads into is, is the body rides on the vehicle. And then at what point does it separate? Well, we know that the impact occurs back here based on the high velocity spatter. And we know that the body comes off in this area when it starts to slide across the roadway, or excuse me, the shoulder. So the Mr. Beaver is struck, high velocity spatter, heavy concentration of high velocity spatter, hole in the windshield, and then continues on to where the body slides off and comes over. So in this distance here, Mr. Beaver is riding on the hood and in the windshield of Attorney General Roundsburg. Let me point out the flash here. Sorry. The flashlight as well. Yep, I got that. Right. Oh, you did. Okay. Yep, and the flashlight, which Please I already press. discussed. No, we'll wait till after the presentation. It's really important on the slide. We'll go back. Okay. I'll, I'll cycle back if you just. Here, mark that slide. Okay, can you just tell me blood slide? I'll remember blood slide if you tell me blood slide. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, and the flashlight. Uh, the other thing to note here is the leg. So Mr. Beaver's body, I, sorry, I got off track a little. Um, so Mr. Beaver rides on the vehicle, is struck, rides on the vehicle, separates from the vehicle, slides across the shoulder and body comes to rest right approximately two feet from the shoulder of the roadway in the ditch. Mr. Beaver's leg is found in this area. Another point of evidence that we used to, to collect was that we separated into was the paint chips. Um, there was one paint chip that you don't see in this slide, that paint chip would be back towards the do not pass sign, which you see over in this area here. That paint chip was determined to not be a part of the actual crash. It came from an incident at some point thereafter. And that was um, reference to, when you read the reports, you'll see reference to quadrants, where we attempted to determine if there was any blood in that area that we may have missed on September 13th. That paint chip is not shown. The rest of the paint chips for the majority of them are shown. This is all of the paint chips that separated from Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle at the time of the crash. There was various parts of a vehicle that were laying on the roadway. Um, there were bolts, there was a washer pump motor, broken headlight pieces, broken inner wheel well pieces and glass. <clears throat> this is the indication of where all the vehicle parts were, all of the black dots. Um, I previously referred to the glass from the windshield. This is the glass from the windshield. <clears throat> this is where, when the impact occurred, the glass comes over the top of the vehicle and it sets on the shoulder in this area right here. We have a picture coming up to show that a little bit. This is the broken front part of the bumper. Um, during Attorney General Roundsburg's interview, there was a reference to he stopped at a part of his vehicle that he saw uh, when he returned the morning after the crash. Uh, when he returns the morning after the crash, he says he saw a part of the vehicle, he pulled to the shoulder and he stops. The only large piece of the vehicle that was left was this one right here, which means Attorney General Roundsburg would have stopped approximately right in this area and Mr. Beaver was right here. This is where <clears throat> all the pieces come off. There was one piece that we located that was in the westbound lane. Out of all of this, out of all of the paint chips, out of all of the blood, out of all of the vehicle pieces, out of crawling around on hands and knees, trying to find anything that we could to um, give us a better vehicle placement in the best manner that we possibly could for our investigation and for North Dakota's investigation. <clears throat> the only piece that we found was right here. And that was one bolt. That one bolt was right approximately two inches from the fog line. 
Um, it was the only piece we found in the westbound lane. This is the glass. <clears throat> I understand it's difficult to see in this picture, but there is glass in a straight line right in line with that tape measure. That line is the same line that you see the purple line right here. That is the same line. We mapped it the same as we measured it. In this line, there is a significant amount of glass. And I understand it's difficult to see, but it is there. Um, the glass is non-reflective glass. The importance of that is, is that it wasn't from the side mirror. If it would have been from the side mirror, it would be a reflective glass. But this was a transparent glass from the windshield. <clears throat> this is the bolt that I described. The fog line, the bolt would be just south of the fog line. So this bolt is actually in the westbound driving lane. Um, it's approximately two inches from the fog line. This is the only piece of evidence that we found in the westbound lane. Everything else was um, on the north shoulder or in the north ditch. This is all the evidence combined. Um, here you see the blue for the blood, you see the red for the paint chips, and you see the black for the vehicle parts. From all of these points, Sergeant Kinney created trend lines. Now, explain what I did here. Uh, Trooper Byrne had asked me to assist with this portion. Uh, if you think about any type of a crash, whenever you have uh, vehicle parts or components that are coming off of a vehicle and there's a significant number of them, uh, they will start in a concentrated area and, and, and fan out, kind of like a V shape. And so uh, one of our concerns was, uh, are these the original positions of all this evidence? And so that's why you see that we've separated them out into those three different categories uh, of vehicle parts, paint chips, and uh, the blood. And so what we did is we took each one of those individual uh, pieces of evidence, meaning all of the blood, and we created a trend line. And what it does is it essentially creates a line that is a best fit line down the middle of that V. Okay, and you can see that the blood uh, shows up in that the blue, just like the colors of the evidence points that we had labeled out. Uh, the vehicle paint chips were red and they were really concentrated along the edge of the roadway. And so you can see the, the darker red line towards the top there. That's the trend line for just the paint chips themselves. Uh, and then we had the vehicle parts, which we had uh, distinguished as a black color. And so you can see that it's in between those two. And those are all within one degree of each other. Uh, when you look at them, if you do a math formula, you can calculate out what that is, but they're all within one degree of each other, indicating that uh, the likelihood that they were moved is very low. Okay, and so uh, we're very confident. They all uh, form a cone coming back to where we're indicating the point of impact is. Uh, on the map. And then you'll also notice that there's a turquoise color. It's kind of between the, uh, the blue and the black one. That trend line looks at all of the components together. And you can see that it falls right in the middle of all of those. And so that's just another added layer of confidence that those pieces and parts did not move. Uh, we know that there was a little bit of wind that evening, uh, maybe passing traffic, and so we wanted to make sure that that was an accurate representation of uh, what occurred uh, that night. And so this just shows us that everything that's there is very likely to have been in the same position that it would have been uh, the next day when we showed up to do our investigation and to complete the forensic diagramming uh, of this crash. And it helps us place the vehicle uh, nearly off the roadway uh, where you can see Mr. Roundsburg would have had to have traveled over the rumble strip with both the passenger side tires and the driver side tires. And so that's why uh, we put the vehicle there. Uh, several days later, uh, we towed we towed Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle back to Highmore. Uh, once we had it back at Highmore, 
I skid tested the vehicle. When I first started driving the vehicle, the, the inner wheel well was pulled in, pushed in and rubbing up against the wheel. Um, so we tested the, I tested the vehicle with that in place and then I removed that. Once I removed it, whether it was there or not, the vehicle uh, performed as would expect it. The ABS worked good braking. Um, the actual friction value that I found was a 0.882. I realize that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but that's very good. Um, that's very good braking. Um, at the time of the crash, this goes back into the uh, numbers that I've already given that it takes Attorney General Roundsburg 614 feet to stop when it should have been less than 200. Um, just reemphasizing that, that he uses about a third of the available braking ability to stop his vehicle. It takes him a long ways to stop. So it's not a panic brake based on where his vehicle's at from where the impact is at. The point of these numbers is, is that he does not just hit the brakes and stop. He slowly stops or he stops and moves, however it is, but it's 614 feet from the area of impact to where the actual vehicle is at. Um, during the testing, there was no drivability issues. There was no drifting and good braking. Um, I drove the vehicle. When I drove the vehicle, I drove it in the westbound lane. I drove it through the scene to make sure that it didn't drift over to the shoulder on its own, that the alignment it wasn't off or anything along those lines. Um, there was no drifting issues. Obviously, there's no braking issues. Um, when I did drive it, I did have to steer it to get over the, the rumble strips um, to do the brake testing. I wanted to do the brake testing in the westbound lane and on the shoulder. I did both. Um, to get it onto the shoulder, I had to drive it onto the shoulder. While I drove it onto the shoulder as the vehicle crossed the rumble strips, there was a definite noise and you could feel the sensation inside the vehicle that you were driving on rumble strips. Um, the speedometer, the speedometer was off. Um, it shows two to five miles an hour faster than the actual vehicle speed. The way we determined this was, is when I was doing the brake testing, the skid testing, um, we had a trooper, is actually Nathan Moore, was using his radar, and I think you did a couple too. Yeah. Um, we use radar on our patrol vehicles to determine what our actual speed was versus the speed of the vehicle. After each run, I would check the speed of the vehicle as well as other things. And each time we found that it varied. The slower you were going, the less it was off, the faster you were going, the more it was off. Um, Attorney General Roundsburg is traveling at 68 miles an hour when his speedometer is actually showing 70 to 73. <clears throat> uh, the headlight analysis. So we obtained a warrant to remove the headlights from the vehicle. Um, I removed the headlight from the vehicle. Um, uh, vehicle headlight experiences uh, hot shock, as we refer to it. If you strike something while your headlights are on, the filament will, for lack of a better term, explode in simplicity. Um, that filament leaves a residue in, with inside the bulb, and we can see that. There was hot shock on the passenger side. The thing that this usually would help us with is, is it would tell us if the high beam or the low beam was activated. In Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle, it was a single filament bulb. There's actually a mechanical device within the headlight itself that tips and causes the high beams to come on. So we know that the headlight was on because it experienced hot shock, but we don't know what setting it was on, if it was high beam or low beam. Whether the vehicle is high beam or low beam, you would have seen somebody. Um, we did the exemplar testing with another vehicle. It was a 2011 Ford Taurus from a dealership in Sioux Falls. Uh, we rented the vehicle. We had a trooper drive it up to pier. I drove it from pier over to the crash scene. And uh, when we did the exemplar testing with Agent Rummel on the side of the road, uh, we put <laughs> Agent Rummel dressed in clothing similar to Mr. Beaver. Um, he walked on the shoulder of the road. While he walked on the shoulder of the road, I was able to see Agent Rummel every time. Um, Agent Aarons rode in the front seat next to me in the passenger seat. Agent Aarons was also able to see Agent Rummel every time as we drove past. The flashlight, it depended on the position of the flashlight. 
if the flashlight was forward, you could see it, or if it was up high, you could see it very easily. But if he was walking on a swing with it pointing down, then sometimes you couldn't see the flashlight on the back swing. So the flashlight, depending on the location, could be seen most generally. But if it was being swung down low, there were times where you didn't see it. Um, there was other people, when we did this testing, Agent Rummel was walking eastbound on the north shoulder in the same area that Mr. Beaver would have been struck, near the ditch, um, with the flashlight, in very similar clothing. Uh, I would stop at the Highmore DOT shop, I would turn around, I would accelerate, and I would go past Agent Rummel with Agent Aarons. We would go approximately a quarter to half a mile, turn around, and then go back to the Highmore DOT and do it again. A couple of those times when we were not going through the area and another car was passing through, Agent Rummel was able to see those vehicles braking. They saw him. At one point, it was one or two turnarounds. One for sure. One vehicle actually came to check on Agent Rummel uh, as he was walking. Because we were not there with amber lights on, we didn't have patrol vehicles in the area, we had Agent Rummel walking on the shoulder of the roadway. Our patrol vehicles were parked in the uh, High Highmore DOT yard. So people driving just saw a pedestrian walking and were able to see him stop and check on him. We drove the vehicle from Redfield at Rooster's Bar and Grill to the crash location. While we were doing this, a deer jumped out right in front of us. Uh, I didn't hit the deer. And I had the same headlights, the same car, and everything else as Attorney General Roundsburg. A similar car, excuse me, an exemplar vehicle. Based on the exact distances and times, Attorney General Roundsburg had to drive six miles an hour over the post speed limit. This is an average. So based on our going the exact speed limit from Roosters to the crash location, Attorney General Roundsburg to do that same based on the times we've already given you would have had to go six miles an hour over what we drove throughout that time. And I, to try to emphasize that one more way, if he went the speed limit through Redfield, that means he went faster than six miles an hour out on the highway. A non-distracted driver would see Mr. Beaver. Mr. Beaver's face was through the windshield and he rode on the vehicle for a short distance. Mr. Beaver's glasses were located inside Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle. Attorney General Roundsburg stated his headlights were on low beam. It is proven he was distracted. Attorney General Roundsburg is proven to be driving on the shoulder of the road. He crossed the rumble strips with the right and left side tire of his vehicle. Attorney General Roundsburg walks past Mr. Beaver's body. The body is within two feet of the shoulder. Attorney General Roundsburg has his phone flashlight on. Attorney General Roundsburg later tells BCI, he was searching for the deer on the shoulder in the ditch while walking. Mr. Beaver's flashlight is on along the shoulder of the roadway. One thing I, I didn't mention, uh, I showed the map of Mr. Beaver laying two feet from the shoulder of the roadway. Um, the flashlight was facing uh, west, so a person standing to the east would have seen a flashlight in the ditch as um, was mentioned by other, you know, the sheriff at the scene. Um, that flashlight was not that far from where the body was at. Attorney General Roundsburg crosses the rumble strips with both sides of the vehicle. Attorney General Roundsburg is driving completely on the shoulder near the ditch. Mr. Beaver is walking eastbound on the shoulder near the ditch with the flashlight. Mr. Beaver's face goes through Attorney General Roundsburg's windshield. After impact, it takes Attorney General Roundsburg 614 feet to stop. Attorney General Roundsburg walks past Mr. Beaver's naked body twice with a light on as he searches for what he struck. Attorney General Roundsburg returns following day to search the South Ditch, but he goes to the North Ditch 
and parks within approximately 25 feet of Mr. Beaver. The map that I indicated with the vehicle parts and the bumper, that bumper that I described is approximately 25 feet from where Mr. Beaver's body was. So when Attorney General Roundsburg stops on the shoulder, uh, that's how close he is to Mr. Beaver's body. Um, he's traveling 68 miles per hour, but a speedometer would indicate he's closer to 73 miles per hour. Based on these facts, Attorney General Roundsburg was distracted. He was driving on the shoulder. Mr. Beaver's face went through the windshield. Attorney General Roundsburg never sees Mr. Beaver. It doesn't matter if Attorney General Roundsburg's lights are on high beam or low beam. You're going to see a person walking on the road at some point with your headlights on. And we know his headlights were on because of the hot shot. It takes Attorney General Rosberg 614 feet to stop, which is a lot further than what it should have has been described. Video, thank you. We have a video that was taken from a drone um, on the 13th. This is traveling westbound. The vehicles are patrol vehicles. You can see the cones. <clears throat> can you pause it? Pause it. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick before he before he moves on, uh, he said that this is a video of the scene. It's actually not a video. What it is is uh, it's it's a drone that's flying over, taking multiple pictures, and then there's a process called photogrammetry. Uh, in this case, uh, the North Dakota BCI uses a program called PIX4D, and it knows the location of the drone at each of the locations of all the photos, and then it, 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 sorry, it identifies points that are the same in all the photos, and based on those photos, it creates a, a 3D model or, or scale uh, drawing of what that looks like. So this is not the actual video from the drone. This is actually a 3D model from the drone. That's why the patrol vehicle looks a little bit uh, like it's got some dents in it and stuff. But this gives you an idea of what the lay of the ditch was, uh, what the roadway looked like, uh, and kind of where everything was in relation to uh, the investigation. So go ahead. Uh, yep. So we're getting up to the area now where you see the black circle um, is going to be where the body is. The marks from the body you're going to see right in this area right here. Here's the bone marking marks, body marks, body marks, body. The distance from here to the body is two feet, approximately two feet. That's how close it is. The leg is the other black spot. You want to go back to the PowerPoint so we can answer questions off that. Do you have anything you want to say before we switch to that? No. <clears throat> 
Now we'll begin the question and answer uh, session with <laughs> the presentation. Again, only legislators will be asked, will be allowed to ask questions, whether in the room or on Zoom. We will start with those in the room. The one thing I would ask legislators if their questions is please keep your questions that pertain to the investigation that they did, that the Highway Patrol did, that they can speak to what they did in the investigation. So we would ask you to do that. Please, um, we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can, depending on how many people have questions. So we would just ask you at this point to live, for legislators to limit their questions to one at a time. And we will bring a microphone over here uh, that you can, um, in the room, and then we'll go to Zoom. Representative Goodwin, since you asked the first question. I would like to ask all my at once. One at a time, please. I got like 50. One at a time. We got to make sure everybody gets it. I officially would like to protest not being able to ask all my questions at once because I didn't get to ask as it went through. And I've been a marked on my paper, be very organized. I think it's the questions other people would have. So I just protest your ruling on that. First question I have then is uh, Did the House Select Committee see the same briefing we just saw? No, sir. They did not. No, sir. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Uh, Representative Dean Wink, oh, at any time did any of your investigators ask the Attorney General to do any kind of a, not only a, a test for alcohol, but for other drugs? The blood test was taken on the 13th at, I believe it was 1.39 p.m. For the, that was the blood test that was gathered by the Highway Patrol the next day. And nothing showed up in there? Nothing showed up in there, correct. Yes, okay. Please identify yourself as well. No one, Will Mortensen, uh, House of Representatives here at Pier. You mentioned a number of text messages and phone calls that the Attorney General made the night uh, following the collision. Were any of those to his subordinates in the Attorney General's office? Uh, that part of the investigation was through North Dakota BCI. The, the times we used for portions of our crash so we use the times with what the events were, but to specifically say who they were to or from, I can't answer. Were they made as he was driving back to the year? Yes. Okay. okay. We don't have any questions yet from those on the Zoom. So Representative Goodwin, if you'd like to come and ask a couple of your questions, please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I asked, get to ask a couple, so I'll try to do that. Uh, Representative Tim Goodwin, District 30. Uh, at 1021, uh, you indicated that uh, uh, Attorney General's phone was on something called Riding Dragon. Does anybody know what that is? That was an article about Joe Biden. Oh, so he's reading that? Yes, that would be the interview that's been, I'd be, been made public. public. A follow-up yeah. to that, was it, was it an audio or was he reading it, do, do you know? I, I reviewed the, um, North Dakota did the phone downloads. North Dakota obviously did the interviews. I was given information as well as Sergeant Kinney, um, information regarding the information found on the phone. And from that information, it told me if the screen was on or off and what was being accessed and what time it was being accessed. And the riding the dragon was an article that was accessed at that time. Thank you. Next question on the 614 feet versus a normal panic break uh, was 174 feet. Uh, so uh, in your opinion, your professional opinion, once impact, he didn't hit the brakes hard, he just leisurely slowed down? It would be speculation to say exactly what he did. We just know that it took him 614 feet to stop. Okay, thank you. Uh, it said on, uh, on uh, Attorney General's call, after the incident that he was in the middle of the road? Did I see that someplace that he said his car, he was on the middle of the road on impact? To the 911 dispatcher, I believe. When, and also on the first, I didn't see it on the brief, but on the first call in, uh, did he identify himself as the attorney general? 
And I, I know we know he identified himself by Jason Roundsburg. Did you say uh, he was the attorney general? I don't recall. I, th okay. I, I okay. believe he did, but I, I don't recall. Can you check that? Yes. We can, yes. Thank you. One more, sir. Representative uh, when you is, refer to the fog line to us, Lehman, that's the white line? That's correct. Okay, thank you. We now have questions on Zoom call. One more for Representative Morrison. You're in the room. We'll let you do one, please. So, gentlemen, first, um, I was glad that we started out with the qualifications. I've got a lot of respect for the work and the qualifications you both got. Would you tell me? Uh, how extensive this investigation was compared to most that are done? Was this among the most thorough you've seen? Was this pretty standard or was this collected and move on? To give you an example, I, I mean, every investigation is different. Um, I have cases that were manslaughters and I rented vehicles. This is not the first time that I've rented a vehicle to do exemplar testing. Um, if we're able to test drive a vehicle that was involved in a crash, we do it regularly. I just test drove a vehicle involved in a, a vehicular homicide three weeks ago. The mapping of a scene is every fatal crash. We mapped two scenes yesterday in um, District 1, my district. So to say that we map a scene every single time, every fatal crash, whenever we can. To skid test or drive a vehicle, if it's possible, yes usually crash damage prevents that. In this particular case, it did not. Um, the flying the drones, um, we fly drones whenever possible. Uh, what else did we do? I, I would only say the other thing is, is that uh, sometimes the length of our investigation depends on how forthcoming the people that, are, that we're looking into uh, are with the information that we need to make sure we're completing a thorough investigation. And so uh, when somebody's not forthcoming with that information, it does take us longer because we're out looking for the facts to make sure that we present a whole case. We, we need to go to the, the calls in the, on the Zoom, but we'll take one more in the room. Thank you, Representative Dean Wade. And just as a follow up to my first question concerning the any uh, test done as far as blood work, or uh, was that done that night, or was it done the next day, or what was the timing of those tests, please? It was the next afternoon. So it was quite some time after the crash. Thank you. I, I would just expound on that a little bit. Uh, because the Highway Patrol, those tests were not completed right away because the Highway Patrol was not called to the scene that evening. At that point in time, we were not aware of what happened. Uh, as soon as uh, we were looped in and we knew what happened, uh, that's, and it, that's right away when we called Sergeant Schneider uh, to come to peer and to take those blood draws as soon as possible. And so that's why there's a delay uh, from our perspective. If there had been any alcohol possibility that evening, Sheriff Volick would have been the one that should have collected that uh, blood test. All right, now going to online questions to Representative Fitzgerald. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, you said that the victim's body was on the hood of the car and his face was through the windshield. In your estimation, how long do you think his body was on the windshield? And then number two, would that have been easy to tell at that point that you had hit a human being? That would be my question. Thank you. So, yes, his face went through the windshield. Um, we know that from the glasses that are inside of the vehicle, the hole that's in the windshield, where the glasses were deposited there, the amount of time would be from uh, the area of impact where the high velocity spatter is to where the body comes off of the vehicle here. So in that area here, the body would be on the vehicle. Uh, I don't have a specific distance on that in front of me but that would be the two scale map of where he was at to and from. Um, we do know that uh, the distance that you see there, obviously where the blood uh, was located between there and where the next evidence is located, uh, whatever that distance is, a vehicle that's traveling at 68 miles per hour is, is traveling approximately hundred feet per second. And so uh, that's gonna be approximately hundred feet on there. So that's 
you know, a second or so. All right, next online question is coming from Representative Fred Deutsch, District 4. Thank you. Um, earlier this year, I was involved in a uh, high-speed automobile collision, and afterwards I was disoriented. Um, I'm wondering, is that a potential uh, answer to why uh, the Attorney General did not have a, a a panic break? Was he ever asked if he was disoriented? Could that have played a role in him not finding the body uh, shortly after the accident? Can you comment on that, please? In, in my expert opinion, uh, if you look at uh, the collision that you were involved in, I'm assuming would be a collision that maybe there's more than one vehicle involved. It really depends on the dynamics of the crash itself. Uh, when you're in a vehicle uh, that weighs, you know how much uh, Mr. Rounds be, Bird's vehicle weighs? It'd be around three, three to four thousand yeah. pounds, and you strike a pedestrian. Uh, it really doesn't matter what size the pedestrian is. Your vehicle is not going to slow down significantly, which is why the airbags did not deploy inside the vehicle. So there's really no reason for Mr. Roundsburg to be disoriented uh, because he would have not been thrown around inside his own vehicle at all. Thank you. Next, um, some online questions is Representative Charlie Hoffman, District 23. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, thank you gentlemen for the most professional and serious Zoom call I'll, I've ever been on and hopefully will ever be on. Uh, my question is, if you can answer, did the AG give any explanation for not seeing a person in the headlights, a head in the window, and a body flying off of his car that next day? The, the only explanation we were ever given um, would be the video from the interview that BCI did uh, when he states that he was adjusting his cruise control or the radio uh, he said he really couldn't remember, but he believed it was something along those lines, I think is how he worded it. Um, that was the only explanation that we were ever given as to what he might have been doing. Uh, our distraction fell based on the facts that the area of impact is so far off the roadway, it takes him so far to stop, and just has been described the amount of evidence found inside the vehicle um, from the impact. We don't know the answer other than it's not normal. And it leads us to definitely believe a distraction. Next from the online questions is Representative Olson identified as iPhone 3 on the Zoom call. Yes, thank you. I just had, I would like to clarify when you were describing driving the vehicle and replicating the events, was that done at the same time of day? or in the same darkness. Can you clarify that for me? The, the exemplar vehicle part, yes. Um, when we took the, um, we put the exact same headlights that were in Attorney General Roundsburg's vehicle in the exemplar vehicle that we rented. The rental vehicle exemplar testing was done um, the same time of night that the crash would have occurred under the same conditions. Okay, next question from the online is Representative Duba. Um, thank you both for this very detailed um, investigation that you're giving us today. I appreciate it. Uh, Representative Goodwin asked if the select committee heard your testimony and you indicated no. Can you tell me why? I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, so we had prepared uh, the same exact presentation for the House Select Committee. And uh, when we got there, we were advised that uh, they had read all of our reports and they were gonna ask us the questions that they had. And so we weren't allowed to give the presentation uh, or the overview of what our uh, investigation entailed. We were only allowed to answer the questions that they had uh, in regards to Attorney General Roundsburg's crash. 
All right, we're going to Representative Ryan Swack next. Ryan Swack, I'm going to unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, th the majority report of the House Committee leaned heavily on the location of the bone scrape um, in its conclusions. I was hoping maybe um, you could explain how the bone scrape was accounted for in your investigation and how um, that um, influenced your um, report and its conclusions. You can so. What we did is the portion that I talked about was with the trend lines and the trend lines look at the evidence as a whole. Uh, you cannot take uh, pieces and components out that you don't like or don't want to look at and uh, ignore those. This is a case that involves all the evidence. You have to, the blood did not move. The blood stayed where it was uh, when we were there the next day. You have to account for the blood to the far east of the scene and the trend line uh, that only looks at the bone scrape does not account for any of the other evidence, including uh, the flashlight, the fork, the blood splatter, any vehicle car parts. Uh, and so to ignore all the information or all the evidence that's to the east of where that bone scrape is uh, would be a gross representation of, of what actually happened that night. And so that's why uh, it wasn't considered as a, as a plausible answer. We had to consider all the evidence that was presented to us. So that's, that's why, uh, that's what we did with the trend lines there. Okay, going to Bruce Bell and go back. I believe Representative Duba has a follow-up question. Representative Duba. Thank you, yes. You indicated that, uh... Attorney General Roundsburg used his flashlight approximately from 1024 to 1033. And then you said at the point in time where he took his took a picture, obviously the flashlight was not in use, and that is about the time that the sheriff came to the scene. Now I Yes, that's correct. The uh, The phone flashlight was on until... It, didn't he say that he entered with his flashlight? So we didn't, we didn't, he must have been cutting out. We didn't hear the whole question. So could you repeat it, please? Yeah, did I recall where he said in his interview that he and the sheriff used his phone flashlight to search, but you've indicated right here that his flashlight was only in use for these time frames, and then the sheriff came. That's that's what I heard you say. Correct? I don't recall what Attorney General Roundsburg said about flashlight use, but I can tell you that based on the phone information, the only time that his cell phone light was on was from ten twenty six fifty nine to ten thirty three fifteen. Thank you very. We now will go back to those in the room if they have any questions. Senator. Representative Tim Goodman, District 30 again. Uh, I didn't get an answer. He didn't identify himself as the Attorney General, so you don't have to look back at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the flashlight, uh, it was on the next day, so we assume it was on that night. I mean, it didn't go off and come on, probably. So. How far away from the body was the flashlight? So, and I'm glad you brought that up because we did replace the batteries when we did the exemplar testing. I'm sure you did. We put new batteries in it um, to do the exemplar. Oh. Um, so approximately 120 feet, 120 feet uh, your flashlight would be right here along the edge of pavement and the body down there. So next to the road, the body is two feet from the white line, I call it. I know you guys call that something else. And so 120 feet from there, still next to the white line would be the flashlight? Uh, next to the edge of pavement. So where the shoulder separates to grass, 
Right. The flashlight was right on that separation okay, from I asphalt. That, I said that wrong. So okay. Okay, that's good. And then uh, you said that when uh, Attorney General Roundsburg came back the next day to search for what he thought was a deer, what he said was a deer, he parked within 25 feet from where the body was? Yes. So this piece of bumper right here, mm -hmm. um, most of these parts are very small. Mm -hmm. A little piece of headlight, a little piece of um, glass mm -hmm. or bumper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's little pieces all over the place. Um, which is what we're explaining. It's a high concentration to tell us that this is where the crash happened. It's not right. things that are going to blow. It's heavier pieces. The biggest piece was what I refer to as the piece of bumper on the map there. That piece, we actually drew an outline of it when we mapped it to show how big that it was. And what you see, the these are just small dots covering a tiny little piece. This is actually the size of that piece of bumper that was there. And in his interview, he described a piece of the vehicle that was there. This is the only piece that you could really say was from his vehicle because it was so large. The other pieces match because of, we looked at them, the color, the design, things of that nature. But from this to the body is approximately 25 feet. And his description of stopping was next to that piece. Okay, so let me see if I got if I can follow just, on that. Uh, so in Trey General Lonsburg, went back to the scene of the accident the following day using Sheriff Ollick's car. He stopped before he got to the sheriff's house. And where he stopped was within 25 feet from where the body was. Approximately 25 feet. So would that indicate he knew where the body was before he got there? That would be speculation. Okay, thank you. We'll go back to Zoom. We'll come back to the room in a little bit, but we do have some other questions via Zoom. All right, next question up is Representative Mills. Representative Mills. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the presentation, there was a still shot taken, I believe, from a video of Mr. Bieber walking somewhere in Highmore. Uh, and you indicated in there that the video seems to indicate and people identify that he seemed to be walking straight. Can you tell me what time that video was taken in relation to the time of the crash? Uh, the video was 9.31 p.m. And the time of crash, oh, wrong way. Uh, the 911 call was 10.24.22. Okay, thank you. Uh, Follow-up question, if I may? Yes. Um, I think, I think I understand that Mr. Beaver was walking east, which would mean he was walking toward uh, westbound traffic, toward Jason Roundsborg. I'm curious, how do you explain him not stepping out of the way? The, there was comments made to me by Agent Rummel um, from the North Dakota BCI during those, during the conversation. So I, I, I didn't see this. So for me, it's, um, but based on the conversation that I had with Agent Rummel, as soon as we were done with the exemplar testing, the city, the city lights of Highmore, because this is one of the questions that we had also, is if he's walking eastbound, why doesn't he see Attorney General Roundsburg coming at him? And Agent Rummel, when he did this, he would be the best person to answer this, but based on the conversation that I had with Agent Rummel, um, he said it was very difficult to see the placement of the vehicles on the roadway because of the city lights of Highmore behind. Because when you're walking, you're looking at all of the lights from the city and you're looking at the traffic coming at you. And he said it was actually very difficult to tell the position of those vehicles on the roadway when he was walking. Next up online. Representative Deutsch, District 4. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the presentation of the uh, crash events and the post-crash events. Um, as you know, the legislature uh, needs to use this information to make a determination about impeachment. Um, and the provisions um, are spelled out in our constitution for drunkenness, uh, crimes, corrupt conduct or malfeasance or misdemeanor in office. 
I'm assuming you've read the majority report. Um, I'm wondering, based on the evidence as you presented it, do you disagree with any portions of the majority report? And if so, can you please explain that to us? That'd be very helpful. I think it's important to know that what our purpose here today is, is not to agree with any reports except to come to you and present what the facts of the case are. This is what our investigation entailed. And this is uh, where we stand on what we know happened that evening. And so anything that would be, on, be beyond that is up for someone else to determine. We're not gonna speculate on that. All right, one more online is Representative Fitzgerald. Thank you, I had to unmute myself. Um, my question is, is there a pattern of Attorney Roundsburg using his office to avoid being held responsible for traffic um, offenses? Thank you. I, I, I'll take that. We're only, we are only limiting this to the investigation of the two troopers on the crash. Those are issues that somebody else will have to determine and talk about the troopers can only talk about, about what they found at the crash. Thank you, Tony. Take uh, one more online before that. We have Representative Warren Lesmeister, District 28A. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for presenting us with this information too. You guys have done a wonderful job. My question is, in your opinion, was he distracted driving? Uh, how do you explain somebody's face coming through your windshield, their glasses coming into your car, a significant amount of glass coming inside of the vehicle, that person staying on your vehicle for approximately a second and being that far onto the shoulder then stopping 600 feet, which is three times the normal stopping distance, other than saying that they were distracted. All right, we now will go back to the room for representatives. Thank you, Representative uh, Dean Wade again. You talked about the body being uh, two foot off the, the highway in the grass. I'm just curious, um, the length of the grass, I mean, is it was it obvious or was the DOT, sometimes they, they mow the, you know, the, the grass alongside the highway. We're, we're talking about two inches of grass, we're talking about a foot of grass. Uh, how obvious was, was the body uh, when it was seen the next day? So that's a, that's a good question. So if you were driving, one of our questions was also, you know, obviously there was people driving through the area. Why didn't somebody see it prior to this, him coming back to the scene? There's a fairly good slope as you saw in um, the, the uh, 3D, point 3D, thank you, <laughs> the 3D point cloud that we showed you. And in that, you can see there's a fairly steep slope on that ditch. So even though it's only two feet off the road, when you're sitting low in a car and driving by there, you can kind of see something, but you really couldn't tell what it was. But once you got out of the vehicle, you could definitely see. In relationship to the grass, this is a lot of gravel. In some of these, and specifically, I know the blood to my right spot, you can see the grass. So there's a lot of gravel in this area. So where the transition goes from the shoulder to um, the grassy ditch, there's also gravel in that area. And within that gravel is where we find a lot of this evidence. The body is not far past that. And the, I would say that the grass is obviously matted down from his body, first of all. And then secondly, we measured it and we measured it at night and we looked at things laying there. Um, and in the photos of the case, that was, I don't know if what's available to everybody, but it should be out there that there's photos of the grass taken at night with the tape measure that we measured it. And I don't recall the exact measurement, but we did look at that and it was less than what the body would have been laying there. And I would say a foot ish or less, but once again, sparse, not, not a heavy grass, a sparse grass. And I would, I would only add to that, that uh, like 
Trooper Burnt was saying a vehicle that's passing by your perspective is a little bit different because you're in the driving lane towards the uh, center line. Whereas if you're standing up walking, you can easily see down. Uh, and then to add on to top of that without being too graphic, again, Mr. Beaver was naked basically from the shoulders down and had a very pale white complexion. And so if you're walking by at night with a flashlight, light will reflect off of that color very easily. And there would be no reason that he should not have seen it. Anybody else in the room? Gentlemen, would you give me what percentage confidence you have that Mr. Beaver was outside the fog line and off the road at the time of the collision? Beyond the reason of a doubt. You give me a percentage. Uh, you bet. This is Will Mortensen, representative out of here. I'm very confident. I, I would say I'm 95% plus. And after our investigation was complete, uh, our investigation was reviewed by uh, John Daly out of Jackson Hole Scientific, and he reviewed all of the information, and he came to the same conclusion and agreed with everything that was in our report. Well, appreciate it, gentlemen. For my own self, I believe you. I believe in you. So thanks for all the work you did. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Any uh, other questions from the, those in the room? Uh, we have one online before that. We have Representative John Mills. John Mills. Thank you. I think in your presentation, there was mention of a toxicology report on Mr. Bieber, and I, I didn't recognize the substance or, or what that said, but could you, in layman's terms, tell us what, what that toxicology report determined and, and what does that mean in terms of level of impairment? It was negative. Um, it's it just that there was nothing found. It, or I'm sorry, you said Mr. Beaver. Right? I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Beaver was prescribed um, within my report that's been released. You'll find that we searched um, the vehicle that we found in the north ditch that Mr. Beaver had been driving earlier that day. Um, inside that vehicle, we found a prescription bottle with two Mr. Beaver that contained some lorazepam pills. So he was prescribed lorazepam and the autopsy showed that he had lorazepam in his system. It was not a fatal amount of lorazepam, but the way it was described to us is that it was a higher than normal level of lorazepam in his system. We'll take one from inside the visitor center. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for giving us this briefing. I really appreciate it. I know it's difficult to talk about this. It's difficult for the family to be here, but I appreciate all the work you did for that. And I hope you didn't think any of my questions were needling you or anything. We're just trying no, to uh, get the information fine. we could. So I just want one question I want to ask one more time to make sure I got it right. When you went before the select committee, they turned down getting this briefing from you two gentlemen. Essentially, uh, we did prepare the presentation. Our understanding is, is that it was made known to them that we had a presentation that we could walk through the case. And my understanding is they said no. And so you at no time gave anyone on the select committee this briefing? No, This sir. is the first time it's been seen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Goodwin. I believe we're, we don't have anybody else on the, on the call, so if there's no other in, within the, uh, in the room here, we will wrap up this presentation. Thank you for everybody being here and on Zoom. Um, to, fill, for, uh, to fulfill some open media requests uh, made to the Department of Public Safety on this investigation, additional information on the investigation will be released later today on our website at uh, dps.sd.gov. Any media members on the line or in the room that have questions or clarifications, you can ask me as well. Again, thank you very much for being here. Have a good trip home.